Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this Zoom webinar. We are already aware that we are reeling under COVID-19 and its present effects. We continue to scramble through virtually reconfigured approaches looking for solutions in this crisis. There are no absolutes. We need to navigate collaboratively to find solutions and support this journey of reconstruct. Art and culture individuals, organizations and institutes cope with new mechanisms of working to tide over crisis and lament the loss of the real sensory that the arts and culture requires for its appreciation and existence. My name is Linika Jacob. I'm the managing trustee of the Kala Chopal Trust, which is a not-for-profit organization working these last three years to create a culture for development ecosystem through a multi-stakeholder approach. In COVID-19, those issues have now magnified tenfold. Helen Frederick, who is the curator of the Kala Chopal as an organization, and I are very grateful to the Embassy of France and French Institute in India in believing in us so as to collaborate to bring this webinar series to you. We agree that the virtual scramble is reaching a crescendo level. Can we hear ourselves anymore? Can anyone else hear us? How can we approach this virtual world to support arts and culture and environment? And how do we then find continuity for the long term? We bring to you the dichotomy, irony, and poignancy that lies within these questions over the next four weeks through a lineup of teamed panelists that are stalwarts and leaders in their critical areas of work, practices starting with a critical moderator in this session. Ravi Agarwal will be moderating the first part of the webinar session, which has been aptly named by the curator of the Kala Chopal, Free Fall of the Creative Paradigm. Ravi is an artist, environmental campaigner, and curator with a work practice that spans 25 years. He has campaigned through his multiple projects on environmental causes. The esteemed panelists consist of His Excellency, Dr. Bertrand de Harding, Councillor for Education, Science and Culture, Embassy of France in India, and Country Director, French Institute in India. He is a lover of arts and culture and the value it brings to the development of humanity. He has been in India according to him 10,000 years. In real terms, that's four and a half. And he works through the multi-channel approaches to develop the Indo-French alliances and supports. Alice Odin, founder and chair of Art Change 21 and co-founder and former chair of the French Association Coal, Art and Sustainable Development, who sets the note on her journey to environmental activism and global thinking through the Mask Book Art Project that is designed to raise awareness about air pollution and climate change, and with whom the Kala Chopal Trust is now collaborating on the Mask Book India campaign. Last but not the least is Jack Rasmussen, who's the PhD director and curator of the American University Museum at the Casson Center. In relationship, the was open in September addressing issues in the USA election, environment, immigration, human rights, surveillance, and addiction. I invite Ravi now to take this forward. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Klinika and Helen and the Kala Chopal for inviting me and inviting us to this really interesting uh, uh, session. Um, to introduce the topic, my perspective, um, uh, just a few words, and before I get the panelists in, uh, I think precarity and vulnerability is a characteristic of art and part of the art of uh, life of artists. Uh, and artists are deeply aware of the ideas of precarity and vulnerability at all times. Uh, but the art institutions, uh, which are part of the art community, provide com continuity, stability, and financial as well as psychological sustenance. And when that collapses, as that seems to have done now, it leads to several. several types of breakdowns and uncertainties but are also extend to the artistic community and they're very hard sometimes as they seem to be very hard to deal with and uh, including financially uh, this event i think uh, uh, shines a light on the structures of the art world the galleries the museums the markets and the artists uh, at the base of it uh, there has been a collapse of museums galleries and markets and these there seem to be no easy end in sight the question we want to discuss today will deal both with the nature of the collapse, but also the kind of alternative models of support for art production and viewership, which can be envisaged in the, in the coming future. 
does this imply a paradig uh, paradigmatic shift or will these new ways become part of what we have or will be will this be uh, a new world of art institutions uh, so it will be an extension of what we do or will something get reconfigured my three panelists here uh, uh, Bertrand, Alice, and Jack, uh, who have been, I guess, introduced by Lene Kayo, uh, are very precisely placed to answer these questions. So I will just start uh, straight away and pose the question to the three panelists. Uh, you could like to refer on what is the nature and extent of the collapse going to the panel, uh, if you would like to call it a collapse, and what has been the impact on your programs and institutions and if uh, if Bertrand if you don't mind taking the floor followed by Alice and then by Jack thank you thank you very much Ravi and uh, thank you uh, Enika and uh, all your team for introducing everything yes actually it was at least the very first first day the collapse it was supposed to close on the 29th of March, and of course it closed uh, some weeks uh, before the foreseen date. When you cannot allow the people to have a, a direct contact, a physical emotion, uh, a direct perception of the work of art, and the same goes for uh, being allowed to go to a theater, to play a theater, to see a theater play, or a movie, uh, being able to go to the concert, to watch the music, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a loss. It's a loss, and hence this, uh, the importance of this discussion. But I'm a very optimistic uh, guy, and I think you, know, you can also see a crisis as an opportunity to develop uh, other things, or to what could we do with that crisis? I don't think this has a choice. For whatever reasons, uh, uh, most of the governments that were of them, but most of them have decided that you know it's better for the health of everybody to stay at home uh, and to minimize the contact with people. You as well, some people have those very limited visits of museums, which could be a way for maintaining that. But in that case, people will tell you, yes, but how will the people go to the museum? So, to the brief, I think we have to find a, a way to maintain the momentum, uh, even if we cannot implement the momentum right now. Which means, basically, again, taking the crisis as an opportunity to say, okay, guys, you are not uh, allowed to go to the museum, to go to the theater, to go to the gallery, to visit your, your painters, friends, your book. But what about, uh, you know, developing your own knowledge of the artists or the artists you know, or you still or yet don't know, the musicians you've heard about, but you're always too busy and to, you know, spend to really carefully at home listening to them. And so I think our, our main role now is to prepare the, the next wave, the moment where people will be able to go back and to bring them as many knowledge, as many tools, as many possibilities to better deeper understand what they could see, what they could hear. Thank you. Alice, you've been working with uh, uh, multiple kinds of projects. Mm. Uh, what is your view of this particular moment? First, before that, I wanted to say that I'm very happy to share this moment with you. Um, um, Art of Change 21, um, as you know, organized many events and mass book workshops in the world. And we were very glad to be in India two years ago. Uh, we partnered with uh, Jaga, Ashana Prasad uh, in Bangalore. Uh, I'm sure my pronunciation is not good. Uh, with Vimlanduja uh, of Swesha in uh, New Delhi. And also with all these amazing people of Jagiti Yatra, this train gathering social entrepreneurs. We had a big mass book workshop with, with 500 of them. And this big journey was absolutely wonderful. And we had wonderful masks. So 
Now, about, uh, I, I like what Bertrand said, because we have to keep the contact between art and people. Um, Art of Change 21 is uh, working at two levels. The first one with contemporary artists. So through many things, we promote what they do and we promote the fact that today, environmentally engaged artists are needed more than ever. And uh, so we try to understand why they are, to, to, to explain why. It's because we understand with this corona crisis that the ecological transition is needed more than ever. And artists contribute in this new mind shift, more cooperation, less competition, more, more long-term perspective, less shorter perspective. And what are we experiencing now? It, uh, and the freedom because freedom was like it's okay when we live in France in democracy but we realize that no it's not okay I believe that might lose its power in our society because we now understand that you know the best is not to consume it's to be free and we will prevent from you know, uh, going out and uh, so I think there is a mind shift I'm very I believe that something will happen and we and culture will play a more important role regarding impact on my association the impact is absolutely positive it was crazy because on this project it started on air pollution with the Chinese artist Wen Feng we had this you know, protective mask as a symbol. And we had plenty of workshops. So the only thing we had to do as mass book was based on the link between health and the environment. So we were absolutely in it, as we know that this crisis comes from the a zoonosis, you know. Uh, so it's based on the link uh, between, um, you know, uh, health and environment. So we only had to launch a new thematic after our pollution and climate change. Hey guys, there is something new. It's, a, you know, an epidemic. And let's work on that with MassBook. What we had to deal with, it's to be very careful with the mask because to say, don't use your real protective mask. You have to take your mask to, for your health. So we had to, push people to, to create masks uh, with paper and everything. So from Art of Change 21 point of view, um, it was a kind of huge opportunity to, to promote the mask book project. And we were so, um, you know, um, happy to receive so, so many portraits from all over the world. And Wen Feng, our friend in China, also led a campaign. So for Art of Change 21, because we were on this health and environment thematic, we were like, oh, okay, we know that. And the mask, which at the, five years ago only concerned Chinese people, now is worldwide. So I received many messages like, you were a visionary with this mask five years ago. Now it's all over the world. So. I'm sorry to look like opportunistic, but when we realized that, we knew that the Mask Book Project will have a big time now. <laughs> uh, the bad point is we are related to many, many artists and we see how difficult it is for them to sell artworks and to, you know, to, 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 to make a living. So um, there is a there, there is an initiative named Les Amis des Artistes, uh, which uh, which helps artists, and we will see how we can especially help environmentally engaged artists so they can cope with the situation. Plus, um, we will organize a big exhibition for the IUCN Congress in Marseille in January 2020 focused on biodiversity and we will 
we are rethinking this exhibition because we think that after COVID-19, it's another exhibition which should take place. And we are working with the Ministry of Ecology and the of, of French Office of Biodiversity now to see how before the, 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 the exhibition, we can organize something online. And my last point will be, you know this exhibition we have to organize on biodiversity for IUCN. Before COVID, we would have only be exhibitioning, catalog, exhibition. And now we think in a completely different way. We know it has to start before, maybe now, there will not be as much people as we can expect who will visit the exhibition. So how can, as Bertrand said, how can we share the exhibition? How can we share what the artists say and do with their project with more people and to find other ways than just an exhibition? And I think that many people are thinking about that now. Uh, we can't, um, you count on just one exhibition. We have to imagine other ways. Thank you, Alice. And, you know, I was meant to, um, I'm in the process of curating an exhibition uh, end of the year. And the question is, it's a multi-site exhibition. And the question is, the whole thing of site changes. What is the site now? The site before is not. So we all have to learn of what this means. And thank you for, uh, for your... Uh, yes, relocalization. We, you know, we will not invite people artists from the US maybe, because we are not sure even in ge next ge January if they can come. It changes many things. I'll come to you, Jack. Jack, you are part of a university museum, uh, a major and very important museum. Your impacts must have been very different. Can you tell us something about how museums and your museum is coping uh, in, in, in the US? Sure, thank you, Ravi. Uh, and I want to thank Helen Frederick for inviting me to participate in this important panel. Um, I'd like to talk about the pandemic and its effect on the AU Museum and what we intend to do about it going forward. The pandemic, of course, is a tragedy for uh, so many people all over the world, and it is probably in poor taste to discuss the inconvenient disruptions to our little art world in the same breath. Nevertheless, the arts are going to play, I think, an important role in making the world whole again. We must help make this new world, and we must not waste this crisis. On March 14th, students, faculty, and staff were told to leave the uh, campus of American University. Classes were to be taught remotely, and uh, the staff would telework. Classes, uh, the museum was closed with six exhibitions on the walls, caught in limbo, and we were locked out. Uh, those exhibitions are still on our walls and will most likely stay there at least uh, until uh, well into June. I wanted to believe that our seven summer shows could go up in mid-June, but as the virus marched through the population, it became clear uh, we weren't going to be able to enter the museum before June, and in any event, art transporters are transporting and uh, storage facilities are closed, and nothing was going to move in time for us to allow us to install our shows before July. So I canceled the summer shows and continued preparations for the fall. We then learned that the university was down about $27 million in lost tuition and rental fees over the summer, and all universities are expecting declines in enrollment uh, for the fall semester, costing many more millions of dollars. So the result is the university directed the museum to drastically cut its budget and eliminate a total of 14 exhibitions over the next 15 months, while extending others as a cost-saving uh, measure. Unfortunately, fundraising has come to a standstill uh, as donors hold on to their cash we won't be able to offset these budget costs. So far, we've been able to keep our team intact, though we have lost a whole cadre of graduate students and contract workers, most of whom are artists. We're directing our efforts at working on our future reopening and ramping up our online presence. Uh, there is a new feature on our website called Museum at Home. Uh, 
Digital catalogs are available for recent exhibitions. Uh, digital storytelling on Instagram features artists scheduled to exhibit. Spotify playlists of songs from artists scheduled to exhibit. Children's art tutorials uh, for parents at home. Staff selections from the collection featured on our e-blasts and on social media. We're working to present gallery talks with artists and curators through different online platforms. Exhibiting artists offering online workshops. Uh, we're hosting a series of online town halls on relevant topics for artists. Uh, for example, we're collaborating with Third Space Network to present an interactive series of panels uh, online titled Raw Hope for Humanity. Our fall shows were all curated with an eye towards addressing issues in our upcoming presidential election. The exhibitions fall under five headings, environment, immigration, human rights, surveillance, and addiction. I'm afraid I failed to imagine that a virus and its fallout would be the most important issue to be faced in this election. Uh, but we must go forward. Our plan is to install the shows and then film them in place to create a more robust and involving online experience should the museum be forced to close again, which may very well be likely. Uh, and yeah. Thank you. October, November or December, uh, we want to be ready for it. Uh, we're showing uh, uh, exhibitions on the environment. Edward Bertinsky's uh, series on water. You can see the loss of the snow, uh, snow on the on the mountains there in that photograph. Um, it's uh, it's aerial and on ground photographs of man made structures, agricultural fields, dams, and natural habitats all affected by climate change. Rotinsky's hope is that these photographs will stimulate a process of thinking about something essential to our survival, something we often taken for granted until it's gone. Uh, then immigration, two shows on immigration. One is by Alan Gerson, a human rights lawyer and advocate who turned to photography uh, and has created large photographic murals of the Mexican side of the US border wall. The photographs examine the immigrant experience and idealized images of what may lay north. You see them here. I mean, we, we've often talked about art, about immigration being a weapon uh, from, uh, from, from Mexico into the United States, undermining our way of life in the, in the news. But uh, actually, uh, the other show by McRae Pita, uh, is a, she's a Uyghur artist um, and her work focuses on a continuing campaign by the Chinese government to destroy Uyghur culture through forced immigration of Chinese into Uyghur land. So she's an extremely powerful and uh, brave artist. Uh, and human rights. Uh, the first show is uh, Queer Threads, Crafting Identity and Community. Fiber art here is posed as the ideal lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender medium. It being feminine, masculine, high, low, and at least in the context of this judiciously racy show, naughty, nice. There's a few more images coming up. Okay, nice. And then we're showing uh, Amber Robles Gordon. Uh, mixed media artworks deal with the artist's own Caribbean Puerto Rican descent, uh, gender binaries and how we treat men and women versus how we treat our possessions and the environment. Uh, the next series is on surveillance. Uh, Bev Ryan uh, creates, creates an installation throughout the museum, everywhere you look, up in the ceiling, down below, behind corners, around corners, uh, images of weaponized surveillance watching the visitors to the museum. And uh, we're working on that. And then a show on addiction. Uh, it's a video installation by Suzanne Furstenberg addressing the scourge of opioid addiction, as well as addiction in its more familiar forms, such as smoking, cell use, cell phone use, and shopping. Uh, the challenge, as we've been talking about, is to present art online in a compelling way. I believe we haven't seen the last of real objects in real museums. I certainly hope not. But we can take advantage of new media to provide a richer context 
uh, for our exhibitions and begin to expand and reach a new audience uh, through these new uh, new efforts um, and reach them with, I think, important and necessary ideas. Thank, thank Thanks, you. Rob. Thank you, Jack. That's really, thank you for sharing uh, your concerns and your, uh, your future exhibition. I just have uh, just a few short brief, if you could answer briefly three short queries. One is, is what you're suggesting for your museum, is that a general thing happening in, in the US across the museum world and the institution world? And uh, secondly, uh, when you translate this to online, do you, have the, do you have the capacity already in the museum to do that? Because this is uh, something which we are doing, like showing something on the website, but it requires a whole technological sort of uh, relearning in a sense. Well, everybody is scrambling to figure out how to have a presence online. I mean, that's everybody's uh, necessary goal right now. Uh, we, of course, are a small university museum. We don't really have the resources that the National Gallery has. I mean, they'll probably never miss a beat. Uh, they're completely ready for this. Uh, we are trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, forums like this, we're, we're learning how to navigate the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, these different forums with this whole series we have on the Raw Hope for Humanity uh, coming up is... Uh, an amazing um, uh, a program that uh, we're, that we're just trying to figure out how to do. You know this this kind of immediate interaction. Uh, so we are learning, and uh, I, as as everybody else is, I I, I presume. Bertrand, coming back to you, uh, you have a very unique position. You are uh, the head of. Um, a bilateral mission between India and France here. So you are not only uh, doing one show, you are you're enabling many things to happen, including uh, contact, collaborations, uh, shows. Um, so you have a much bigger cultural agenda on your hand. And Thank you for the question, Ravi. It's a, it's a very deep one, actually. You know, it's a very positive thing about that uh, global pandemia or epidemia is that it created a kind of a matrix of collective intelligence. And for me, the answer does not lie in a single place. The answer lies in the fact that we, as we are doing right now, can connect to each other and develop together initiatives. Of course, it's not new. We've done that before the COVID. But right now, it's a question of survival. If we don't engage with the other, we are just, we're going to disappear like no. This is not that I mentioned. So, that collective intelligence is a huge asset. And for us, there is no other way than to keep engaging and engaging and engaging again, trying to reach as many people as we can. But there is a bad side effect of that crisis, that it might modify a little bit the desegregation between those who have, or to be more accurate, those who are connected against those who are not connected. And I'm afraid that we have to be extremely careful about not creating a deeper shift between those who are connected, can access all the fantastic exhibition I can now see from what Jack is doing in Washington, that is the people will never think about looking at an exhibition on their very small cell phone that you know they can carry in Canada or wherever in the world. So that for me is the main, not liability, but the main challenge. How do we make sure that we can create a true web, coming back to the very original web when it was created a long time ago, to set a network of people who can spread, not physically, if possible, but using all the possible ways, including the old one, you know, the phone, a simple phone call sometimes, have you seen that, have you seen this? So my dream will be that all together, in collectively intelligent for one, one can always hope, we start to establish networkers, 
people who are in that kind of base, exactly what actually Lenika is doing, or Alice uh, is doing, that we're working with so many people that we can spread, you know, that thing is coming, have a look at it. You may like it, you may dislike it, it doesn't matter, but know it. That's the first very big challenge, which leads to the second one. How do you exist in the world today when every second we receive thousands of messages, images, invitations from all across the world? Due to my position in other countries, I'm extremely happy to be completely submerged in what's happening in Indonesia, in Mexico, in Russia, and all over the world. And you know, I need like seven days per day, not per week, and seven weeks per week, if possible, to manage that. So here again, we have to be cautious about how to be living in an open world, a free world, as Alice was saying, and how to make sure that that freedom helps us. And this is a second challenge, because how could you tell people, you know, this is worse, this is not worse? You're, you're not going to impose, otherwise, the complete, only true positive element of the crisis will just vanish. And people will say, you know, I'm better off if I don't see the other. Because let's face it, we are very happy, we are among the elite, we have all the iPad, iPhone, Samsung, whatever tools you are using, and we can benefit from that. But so many people are free, so many people are homeless, foodless, jobless, and why do they want to, you know, how could they think, okay, come on, I have to make a living, I'll see the eyes of a cultural nation. And that's unfortunately 60 or 50 or 70 percent of the population right now. So again, this is why I think Alice's initiative or, or Lenica's initiative are extremely positive because they establish a bridge, a very strong bridge, because something which affects all of us, the simple fact that we could breathe, and breathe properly, of course, with the importance of culture. I'm a strong believer in the human exchange. I, I, ultimately, for me, you cannot build a sound economy, a sound, you know, whatever you need as a strategic base, whatever, if you don't invest in people, and the best way to invest in people is education, and education without culture is not education, as many, many cultures have shown us through the, the millennia. So now my, my, my job is to establish as many connections as possible between as many people as possible. Yes, I'm working for the French Embassy, French Institute, so of course if they look at the list, I'm extremely happy because I have the feeling that I've more or less uh, do my job. But if you look at Jack and see, you know, Jack uh, holds a fantastic collection called the Corcoran Connect uh, collection. Uh, so many uh, French uh, ma painters, uh, masterworks. I'm going to be equally happy. And I know that you know, the fact that we are building a world which could reach to each and everybody. I think the artist is a citizen. I think we shouldn't analyze the artist. And you know, Ravi, you are a very, very good artist by yourself. I think we should put the artist, and I think this is what Alice is trying to do, actually, that first of all, we look at the artist as a citizen, and we respect the creativity, we respect the freedom, but he's one of us. I so we have to make one of us is one of all of us, as we say in Hindi, Hamlok. You will translate. Thank you, Bertrand. I Just uh, it, it, uh, some uh, follow-up question that, you know, we live in, very two, you are from France and we are from India, the very different worlds. And the current crisis has shown the different, very deep dis, uh, disparities. Uh, you see people walking home. And so my question is that, you know, uh, uh, now with this crisis in, uh, which is global, but in Europe, will it, uh, and with institutes like yours, will there be a shift in cultural funding of some sort? Or you, what do you think if you want to answer that? And in here, it, does it also mean for an institute like yours to refocus on, on issues very specifically uh, because the digital divide is very evident here. The social problems, social equity problems are very uh, clearly more evident here than ever before. So as a, as a, as a bilateral institute, uh, does it also mean refocusing your programs to things which are becoming more and more apparent right now? Think you mentioned the digital divide, you mentioned the inequalities. Does it change your programming as well? And well, the funding? Uh, uh, thank you, Ravi. 
right today, I had to, of course, spend a lot of, I mean, the following, the, the past weeks and the following weeks, I'm going to have to devote a lot of time of improving the partnership between India and France and everything which is going to help. It would be a mistake to say, well, if you invest money in it, you don't invest money in art. Or if you do invest money in health, you don't invest money in the environment. And we know why. Because you cannot separate health from environment. And this crisis is exactly the perfect mathematical demonstration that it comes from a bad or from wherever an evil it came. And it would be the connection for the best or for the worst. So, you want to invest on health, you invest on environment. You invest on environment, you want people to be more aware. And how could people be more aware if not by developing a strong cultural knowledge of the impact of environment? And how do you raise that awareness if not by, you know, allowing people to create freely about that? So, I don't think there will be major shift, at least not for the French government, Inshallah, Buddha, Shiva, and all the others. Um, that we will focus, we will keep focusing on the importance of culture as a key to all the other items. India is actually facing a huge economical crisis, and we all know that the people that are paying for that crisis are A, the poor, and B, the poor women, because they are only, at the end of the road, the people who will support them most, and we know that girls' education will be a, a very, very damaged part of the ecosystem at the end of it, if there is an end. So I think we should focus also by helping institutions who are using each and every tool to raise that issue again and again. There is nothing more important in the world than girls' education, and art and culture is a fantastic way to deal with that. Thank you, but that's heartening to hear. Uh, uh, Alice, coming to you, you have for long engaged uh, in, uh, in the mass project, in the art of change, not the art of, uh, uh, you know, so that's very important distinction you make on the art of change uh, project. Yes. But you're also an artist okay. and you, you have a collab, you, you, you talk to a different world than institutional worlds talk to. What is your sense of the kind of uh, pressures artists are feeling today, uh, what are they looking for, uh, how are they building new solidarities, with whom are they building solidarities, and you work, for example, in a mass project from across, uh, around the world, it's a massive project. So uh, can you reflect, can you tell us something about what is the artistic community and your sense of it, and the future of how we build new solidarities in that? Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't share my, my picture on Matt's book. I oh, we, we, we have your pictures, I think. We yeah, can okay. show them. We can share them. So, I just would like to precise one thing. Uh, I said we were um, lucky, but of course lucky is not the right word. Uh, the book was an offline project, only based on real collective workshops. Uh, we organized with many partners all over the world. So the basis was to gather people uh, they had to meet on story and then it was a very collective moment. But our chance when we designed Mass Book was to imagine some years before that someone alone could participate that we did a lot of special uh, website, massbook.org, where people could post directly one by one. But before the COVID crisis, this was really small. We were only pushing our collective offline real net uh, uh, workshops. But we realized that our chance was to think about digital from this was so easy for us to press the button now and to say we can't gather we can't organize real events but you can contribute to mask book 
online and it's very easy. The garbage, the waste is at home. You know, you can take it. You can take your picture. So we realized that the, we had a, a backup to contribute to the project. So this was important. And about inclusivity, we don't know how to do with that, but we have a part of the project which is called Mask Trotter. It's a globe trotter uh, who meets people who do not access internet. And uh, so he helps someone to do the mask. Uh, so to see how it's possible to reactivate this part, because as Bertrand said, even to contribute to MassBook, you need to, be, to, to, to put something online. So we are thinking about that. And I think that was it important. We have measured the impact of the MassBook workshops, the real offline ones. And we realized that our major impact beyond, oh, okay, I, I will better sort, uh, I will use this and that, I realize that pollution is big is before uh, a, a workshop we had them do you think you are part of the solution they say no i'm too small and after a workshop after they did something by the hand after they were themselves in a process of creation of expressing their messages and create something they change their mind and they say yes i can be part of the solution and I think that art plays a ro role in, at two levels. For a general public uh, to do something uh, through art, even if you're not an artist, is very important to feel oneself as an accelerator or a player of the change. Uh, and I think it's a, a good education to, to stop um, this feeling that, oh, it's to be a company. So this is uh, output. And then contemporary artists who are today environmentally engaged, they have all the solution. If you take Otobon Kanga, the Landversation, she was in Bangladesh um, uh, two months ago. Landversation is a kind of talk with different shareholders and then she creates something from that. Uh, when I see the new ways, projects, not objects, but projects, uh, new ways of dealing with sh stakeholders uh, that artists know uh, how to create new methods for sharing and building together, we think, I think that uh, that kind of artist, and it can be also Thomas Saraceno with his Iro Scene big project to imagine what a post fossil society could be for imagination, for creating this new world. I think we should be more focused on that type of artist. Some of them are very well known. Some of them are less, you know, renowned. And it's important to better know them because when you see an artist, an American one uh, named Michael Wong, his major project is named uh, Extinct in the Wild. He revealed, he, he take, you know, extinct species and he, and he does something like how to, to revive it with art. So there are many, many experimentation by artists today, and many solutions are now in their experimentation, and we must learn from, their, from them more than we do, because we don't know them enough. My database includes 2,000 artists related to global stakes. But if you go to a museum, or an art exhibition or art fair, it's a really a minority today. So we have to find a way to increase, and this is what you do uh, with, um, uh, with your exhibition, of course, because Burton Ski is one of them, very big. Um, and this is what, what, what Lenica does, and thank you so much for what you do, because she pushes that kind of artist. 
And this is what Bertrand will do and that we all share in common. Today, one kind of artist, the one who has decided to play a bigger role within the society to uh, must be um, more, more promoted, I believe. So you're, you're suggesting a solidarity with the society, with the social discourse. You're suggesting that art needs to speak to the social discourse much more precisely. For me, what they do is not that much solidarity, it's innovation imagination of what is new, the new world which has to replace our, our old world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, Linika, just to, because we started late, could I ask you how, how much time we have? Uh, I think you should just go ahead because uh, we lost you in between and the discussion is warm okay. and it's important, I think. Okay. So I think you should just go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Because we'd like to leave some time for questions as well. I think you should leave 10 minutes at the end. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, so this is getting really interesting. And um, uh, I'm, thank you, everybody, for sharing so openly uh, what the challenges and what you think needs to be done. Uh, Jack, if I may now come back to you. Uh, uh, you have given some hint of what you're trying to do. And I, I speak to you because you're in charge of a, of a museum uh, and uh, uh, getting shifts in a, in a system which is so established for such a long time. Uh, because even if you show exhibitions online, then uh, how do you get a sense of, of, of the art you see being physically available to the art and vice versa is very important how we experience art and how art is displayed and stored and collected. Uh, if this thing carries on for, as it might, for longer, where it's hard to get people into museums, uh, footfalls into museums, uh, what kind of shifts could be possible to make these institutions still viable and still uh, in a place they'll survive uh, as institutions? Or do they need some basic reconfiguration. It, it could be speculative thoughts on your part as well. It doesn't have to be. We all sort of trying to figure out uh, and you're well placed to sort of speculate or, or if you've thought about it for us to, to share with us. You're, you're on mute. It's a great question. Uh, and something we, you know, we, we really think about all the time. Uh, you know, we I think we're all talking about the same thing. We want to have an impact, uh, you know, on the world. We want to bring uh, these ideas uh, out and, uh, you know, to the fore. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm sitting here about eight miles from the White House, but, you know, I may as well be on the moon, I think. Uh, but we do have an election coming up. And so, um, so there are ways that we can still impact that uh, through the art we are working with online, but it's, it's extremely difficult. And I hope this is not the way it, we, we have to work. I mean, because there's only so much you can do. I think you can bring more information, you can create a richer context for the interpretation of art, but still uh, we're talking on about basically a, a very analog experience where you really need to be there uh, so I don't know. It makes me makes me wonder. There are artists who work in the digital medium, and they're probably not suffering, you know, too much in what's going on now. That because you can actually see what they're doing the way it's intended to be seen. Uh, so I suppose if this goes on, that kind of artist will be uh, more and more uh, important uh, in in uh, in the in the way it can reach an audience. Uh, but uh, I don't have any answers other than that. Right, no, so, I understand. I mean, I think nobody has both. real answers, but what a, what it, 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 these very sort of uh, old uh, forms of institutions, which like, like the university and the museum, uh, what, 
can can they become will they become different or will they start focusing differently i mean digital art is one thing but art is still such a such a um, is everything there could be so many mediums it's first medium as well well in a way i mean the 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 museum is probably the least green kind of uh institution or you know structure there is you know keeping things to uh uh, relative humidity of you know fifty percent and uh, and uh, temperature control et cetera et cetera et cetera. I mean it's really you you wonder how how this is going to work going forward. Is it really sustainable? Uh, uh, and it, you start a museum becomes a repository for things, and then other institutions uh, start to uh, provide other kinds of experience like uh, you know mask book for example uh where you're not trying to preserve something uh and in addition to presenting and you know uh, new new ideas but uh, but it, things may shift i mean that's that's the way it uh, that's the way it goes jack are you telling yes, me Alice. jack are you telling me that you want to exhibit mask book i i want you to exhibit <laughs> us <laughs> <laughs> in your medium, <laughs> there you go. New collaboration. Yeah. We could maybe collaborate. <laughs> uh, I would love to. I think that the business model of a non-profit yeah. organization. I don't know what you think about that, Lenica. This will be difficult because um, usually you get sponsors, big sponsors. <laughs> Our main sponsor is uh, Schneider Electric Foundation mm. because you build big events with big image so during cop climate we invite very important artists we organize big events and now we don't know when the next cop climate will take place and um and for the iucn congress this will not be this big tens ten thousand scientists and experts from all over the world coming to france anymore so it's not easy to get money from sponsors when you are not, you know, uh, able to say, I will get this person, I will have this wonderful panel, and I will have this audience, and this will take place in this big international event, as we did because we do many other things. In Art Basel, we had a big event last year, we, you know, it's not like the good mood to do something in Art Basel now. We don't know when the COP will take place. So we don't know how we will give us counterpart of images, you know, uh, to our sponsors now. And we took some new ideas on this big international thing for, for a while. So, um, and I think that it's, a, a bit the same for an exhibition. You expect a big opening, uh, major people, uh, journalists coming. So it's not the, the, what you can do now. So how can we uh, get, you know, private or public sponsors and on which basis? Because on communication counterpart, it will not be that easy. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Alice. And Bertrand, I'd just like to op have a short comment from you before we open it up for, uh, for the whole, all the participants for Q&A. Uh, you, you, you are a very experienced diplomat. You've dealt with culture and art for a very, all your life, for a very long time. And so what is your sense of how this, uh, these cultural exchanges between you know, bilateral exchanges, not only here, other countries, how will it be impacted in the future? Because for us, it's a very important part of our, uh, of our art community. You are very important. Other institutes are very important part for our community. What can we expect? Can you tell something to the artists in the art community? You can expect our full support, and that's not diplomatic words. OK, thank you. I, I frankly don't see us stopping, a committing with all of you, trying to find ways. And you know, we are, we are, we've launched a kind of conversation between various French consulars in Brazil, in uh, China, in, uh, in South Korea, in India, and elsewhere, about what will be the, the immediate future. I mean, the 
six months, three years future. And we all see that it's going to be a kind of hybrid between the physical and the virtual or the digital. In a way, it's a good thing. Because you know the big moment with thousands of people Alice was referring to was environmentally speaking not that good. So many you know, plane tickets and all you know the carbon tax, carbon price is high. So we are now thinking about you know mobilize the physics when it's truly needed. But for me, the emotion you have where you are you are facing Picasso. Uh, the home run, the Rosco, or whatever, a soulage, or whatever the ideas are only quoting old guys, so not to believe anybody tell us. The imagination you have, I mean, the way your imagination suddenly opens because you're facing something or someone, because you have that director, that musician, that mentor in front of you, that is something that no line, no online product will ever be able to reproduce. Right. We all have Netflix or whatever, Amazon Prime, uh, but we all still go to the movie because we all know the experience is completely different. So how to make a movie while the online product is going wild? That's something different. Isabel, can we show the, um, the little things you prepared? There is that thing that the, uh, the dancers of the uh, ballet, yeah. To do, and it's quite interesting because it was directed by a very French famous director, Delvis Clapiche, who decided to make a video about those incredibly good dancers mm -hmm. dancing at home because you cannot go to the opera house anymore. And the very funny thing I would like uh, to stress is they've done that to pay a homage, to pay a tribute, you know, to all the nurses, the doctors, the helpers in the virus hospital. And one French Parisian hospital decided to answer and ask their own staff to dance in answer to you know, the gift from the Ballet de l'Opéra de Paris. And for me, you know, that kind of physical exchange through a screen was a good pass toward the one direction because it's, you know, people need to do something, to physically do something. Yeah. You need an answer to that. You need the photographer to take a photography. You need the painter to take the brush, or the sculptor to sculpt, or you know the musician to take his instrument or her instrument that to perform. So let's maintain that right now, since we cannot organize public events. But as soon as it will be possible, and very frankly, we all know the answer, it will be possible the day we will have the vaccine against that virus. How many months it would take, I don't know. Although I'm hopeful that it would come a bit sooner than previously expected. We will push again for physical months, but probably more balanced. Yeah. Uh, Linica, if I may request you now. Allow participants uh, to make. Bertrand's <laughs> Opera de Paris video was the best of the crisis. Yes, <laughs> because it was an emotion yeah, it. Like, like in the opera. We all cried. It was yeah. so beautiful. And Radio France has just launched a, a call for action. They expected it was on classical music and they are overwhelmed by contribution. And uh, I think that what you say, participatory action is a school of cooperation. And yes. I think that that kind of participatory action are really wonderful today. The collective intelligence. Yeah. Uh, when mm. people go into the space, it's not going to be a new normal. There's going to be a, a certain growing uh, resistance uh, and anticipation about being back in the public spaces, for example. And we know that artists are very resistant and they can bring things to the table. But I think the uh, institutions also have to think actively about changing from the higher echelon into what's more, as you're saying, collective. So how do we take this idea of the Bruce Society coming back into public spaces to make them more um, aware of 
what I talked about yesterday is the archive, the archive that's inside all of us, the institutions and the artists, and how do we bring that together in this bruised society? How can we do that in the public spaces? Ellen, who were you addressing? Uh, anyone who wants to answer it. Alice, or might be very good to start. Alice? Alice? Alice, you're muted. Yeah. Alice, Helen is uh, asking you a question. I think it was more a question for Jack. So, uh, Helen, tell me, tell me uh, your question again. Sorry. No, it's all right. We could do, we could do it to Jack because he has a, a museum. Let's, let's uh, give it to Jack. Thank you. Jack? Yeah. Uh, Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, we're spending a lot of time uh, both uh, in the museum staff and in the at the university level uh, and at the state level, you know, trying to figure out how we reopen, you know, how we can introduce uh, ways of working that are going to be safe and, uh, you know, what kind of process that should be. Um, I'm not sure I can speak to uh, specifically what you were talking about yesterday. Um, maybe you could explain it a little more if you have something specific to ask me. Well, I, did, I think psychologically we all feel very uh, changed and like uh, Bertrand was saying, you know, we, are, we have this uh, versatility and we can accelerate as Alice is saying and imagine how we can all work together and work that out. But the, the psychological fear of being back into the spaces is going to be enormous, especially if this continues into a very long period, which it may. It may go into 2021. So how do we plan out to bring back safety and engagement and uh, work on a new platform, not from the idea of who's funding the museums and the, the usual curatorial aspects, but on a new platform? I know we can't define it today, but what are your yeah. thoughts about it? We have to focus on everything, I think. But uh, but certainly, uh, we've already canceled our, our opening uh, receptions, for example. We know that that's not going to probably be a good thing to do in September. Uh, so we're talking about maybe it's uh, maybe people come in by appointment. Or, you know, maybe there's a you know a number of people we can accommodate at any one time uh, in the space. That, that will be allowed. Maybe we can provide uh, PPE, as they say. Uh, you know, I mean, there's going to be, we're going to have to see how we can accommodate uh, this new reality, how we can, you know, help assuage the fears of, of our audience. Because, but still, we're talking about getting people into our space. And, um, and, and maybe that's something we have to uh, think about as well. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the projections on the outshore a few years ago, where everybody went outside and experienced something wonderful. Maybe there's, you know, there are things like that that we can transition to uh, to make sure that people are still outside and, uh, and uh, you know, feeling safe. Alice. Alice. What I understand uh, in platform, but maybe I don't understand very well what you... What well, we always saw the, the museum working from the... A way to collaborate is, is a way to collaborate all together. Um, I think that today, um, the chance uh, is to democratize art. Um, and uh, because it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to practice, we, 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 we were talking about how much is important and we see how many young people like uh, a, a 10 year old Chinese guy doing this mass book and uh, teenagers. So democratize the practice and also democratize like, um, for many people, there is still a gap, you know, going in, in a museum, the perception of the, of the contemporary art as 
something related to capitalism or something too conceptual. And maybe we all have this from is what we can live now, create together now, could be a chance to for the access. Because this uh, digital moment is, uh, even if we know that many people do not have their, you know, their mobile phone, but it's, uh, it's today a very popular tool. And uh, I think that um, we have to imagine together how, how we can use this period, very special period, to push this feeling of, be, of being one, of uniting people, the joy of feeling together with this part participatory project. And we know that art is the, at the best position to, to organize this participatory project. And, you and right. also, You're absolutely right. Community, I think the community drivers to art and the interconnects with, with people is more and more important today. And how does a digital platform work within the sphere for the next six months, eight months, a year, till this uncertainty lasts and we don't have a vaccine for COVID? How do we, how do we last this particular time in the multi ways that we will interconnect, you know, and continue to keep art relevant, exciting, and interconnected and also address livelihoods. I think fundamentally that's, that's extremely important at this stage to create uh, platforms that will eventually support artists and the creative communities. I think that sort of onus lies on all of us. But thank Nubina. you, Nina. Nubina is asking, I have a platform, Disappearing Dialogues Collective, and as an artist, I've always thrived to impact and address environmental issues, but it's tough to get funding, support, or cooperation of art institutes. Do you think this crisis develops a new path for socially engaged art practices and alternative practices in the place of studio practitioners? Institutionals definitely play a huge role. Uh, with collaborations. Uh, who would like to answer this? Tran did talk about uh, reorienting programs a bit, so that falls into that ambit. But Bertrand, if you'd like to say something more. Well, I'm not a thank you, why not? So, uh, in terms of access, going back to what Ali said, because it's also the question behind the platform question, there is under the control of Jack, for a limited number of square meters in any exhibition hall. With an unlimited number of digital speech that is on this world. So I, I'm suggesting that uh, maybe some of us all together, we could develop a kind of network supporting an artist or a group of artists that for some time in any case. but you know getting the the stamp of a known prestigious institution the exhibition there someone is calling to get that we cannot host the exhibition but we will be happy to support your exhibition online it doesn't cost much to put an exhibition online at least it costs much less than to put a physical exhibition insurance fees transportation fees curation fees blah 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 you all know the uh, the nine yards and that is something we could do. And actually, I was thinking about that the other day. And in India, there are excellent initiatives of some galleries who have, you know, joined hands together in order to promote all the artists. And acting again on a kind of matricial approach, a collective intelligence that we together, we support those people. That money does not, it's not a problem that much anymore, at least for that thing. And then who knows, you know, someone would have seen an artwork and say, but I want that one. So I think we also have to develop the online economy of buying art, which is not going to be easy because we all know that, you know, behind me is some painting I bought a long time ago. I would never have put it online, never. So that's going to be a big question for creators, how do you sell? And even Sotheby's and uh, Christie's and all these very important houses, they're not going to sell online. So I think we should, A, step one, 
invite people to bring projects, they create the ecosystem where they say, okay, we support that. We collectively communicate about it because it's mainly communication. And three, if one of you is really interested to support, well, discuss, discuss with the gallery, discuss with the agent, discuss with the artist, and develop a way to go further. I think, you know, I, mean, I think the, the, the question to all these answers is invent yourself, reinvent yourself. Because nobody really has the answer. And it's not by going back to what we've known that we're going to find the solution for a future we don't know. I was in Mexico when the country was closed for the AH1, uh, whatever, A1, H1, uh, I don't remember the complete name. It was very strange to see a country completely closed for opportunity only some weeks. And I remember that day that, oh my God, if one day that thing happens to the world, <laughs> people will have to completely shift their perspective. Right. Um, I think we'll close this now because uh, we pushed uh, extra half an hour on this one. So I just wanted to close, you know, put the closing address out uh, and the Q and A's can keep coming and we will, uh, you know, on the FP live, uh, the video is open and you can keep, uh, you know, looking at it and on, you know, sort of putting your questions there and we'll have somebody answer them as we go along. These are questions that will continue for a while. We are grateful to the collaborators, contributors, and individuals in the organizational teams without whom the series may not have been possible. Very grateful to the audience that have signed in to listen. The next part of the series is the visual environmental situation room, which is going to be moderated by Helen Frederick. Same time, Monday next. Uh, she is the curator of the Kalachow Park Trust. There are three subsequent parts to this series. You can visit all our social media handles for any information that you need. And they will be also posted on the IFI handles. All our journeys are collaborative, and the sooner we work together, the stronger we will be through taking collective and positive steps of reconstructing this creative paradigm. And thank you, everybody, Bertrand. It was so constructive. Alice, thank you for being on it. Ravi, thank you for moderating this. And Jack, thank you for being on it. I know it has been difficult. The churns are very much in all our lives, you know, private and professional. Um, but I think as we go along, we will uh, unravel this well for us and for everyone else. Thank you.